Thank you very much for the song. It uh, prepares my heart for this opportunity of sharing with you the words coming from the scriptures. And uh, thank you very much for the lessons. It was, uh, you know, indeed amazingly presented. And I believe that the Lord has, you know, gave all those lessons for us because we understand that as what I've heard already, that we are all struggling. We are not immune to sin. And as a matter of fact, when we look at the, the history of our, of our church, the church of God, you know, from the chosen people, you know, Israelites, we know that uh, it, was, it was consistent for them to fall. And of course, every time that they fall, when they realize that what they did was not right, they called upon the Lord, even though they were, you know, they were sinners just like us, the Lord answered their, their prayer. And our, our message for today is an encouragement for each one of us. I preached this in Wariman. And I was inspired because this text was uh, actually texted to me. If uh, Starley could still remember, she texted to me this Isaiah, you know, <clears throat> our, our key text, Isaiah 41, verse, verse 3, for, uh, 13. I am the Lord, your God, who takes hold of your right hand and uh, says to you, do not... Uh, do not fear. And I choose as uh, an instrument in encouraging it, each one of us the experience of Joseph. I choose this because the story is so familiar to every one of us. And uh, we, I, I believe that uh, the Lord has, has this story in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, in order for us to learn lessons, to encourage us that we can cross over to the promised land, and which land, Canaan, is a symbol of uh, the place where God had prepared for each one of us. The heaven, the 1,000 years vacation in heaven, and after that, the changing of this world, this earth, making this earth new, and we are going to settle here throughout eternity. And I thank God uh, that he has called each one of us to participate in this great uh, work that is St. Paul had said in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, that, that we were created to do good works and that we are to walk, walk in them. So that's the purpose. And I hear that during our discussion this morning in our lesson study. And uh, the slide, the next slide uh, that you will be seeing involves a number. And uh, there are three important numbers that I am going to include in this sermon. And this is the first number, that's 17. That was Joseph AIDS when he was kidnapped, brought to Egypt, sold by his brother, not because of his own fault. We know the story because Jacob favored him so much and that triggered the jealousy of his brothers. And uh, because Jacob was a dreamer, that also triggered you know, the wrath, the hatred of his brother, because in his dream, they felt and they have sensed that uh, Jacob, uh, that, that Joseph, not Jacob, that Joseph is trying to make it appear that he's greater than, than them. And uh, not only that, Joseph was hated by his brother because he reported something bad that they were doing. 
So that excited so much hatred towards Joseph. And as a result, they think or they thought to kill him. But good enough, there was the elder brother by the name of Reuben tried to stop them. So what can, we, what can we get when we kill him? Nothing. But let us put him inside a pit, thinking that he's going to come and rescue his brother. But when the merchants and the person of the Amalekites, they saw, they, they think something better. We have to sell him to the, to the Amalekites, to the Ishmaelites. And Joseph was so down emotionally during the time because that was the first time that he was separated from his family. But the experience was not pleasant. It was not pleasant, but we can see in the story of Joseph that uh, it was like an experience of up and down. He was, he was up because his father loved him so much, but that love caused him trouble. He, he, was, he was up when he received that multicolored coat because uh, that gives him you know, pride in himself probably, that's my own word, but that again caused him trouble. And uh, he was blessed that God has revealed him something in his dream that in the future he will be above all of his brothers. But again, that caused him, him trouble. So there's an up and down in the experience of Joseph. Now when he was sold to Potiphar, when he was in Egypt, there's still that up and downs of his experience. The ups there, the down side of his experience was that he became a slave. That's not a good experience because way back in his family, he was not treated as a slave. But the text says where Joseph was in Egypt serving Pharaoh, God was with him. God was with him. And that makes a difference. That text is found in Genesis chapter 39, verse, verses 2 and 3. God was with him. And because God was with him, then Joseph experienced a high level of life experience because God was with him. It was recognized by Potiphar. So therefore, he was made as the overseer of the house of Potiphar and likewise all of his properties. And not only that, all that Joseph did during the time prospered. And I remember what Psalm tells me in Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 and 4. If a man don't walk in the counsels of the ungodly and sit in the seat of the, of the sinful, he will be like a tree planted by the rivers of, of water. And all that he will do, God will make it to prosper. And that was Joseph's experience, the height of his experience in Egypt. But another thing, he was blessed to have a very handsome form, a very handsome physique, and, you know, face, face. And that was, again, the cause of his downfall. Because he was handsome, he, he was being the focus of the interest of the wife of Potiphar. He, she, tried to, she tried to tempt him. And as a matter of fact, according to the story that the wife of Potiphar told him, come and sleep with me. And she did not do it once. He did it every day, day after day, until the time comes that when he went to the house of Potiphar, it was only him and the wife of Potiphar, and the wife of Potiphar forced him to sleep with, with her. What did Joseph do after that? 
he ran away from the wife of Potiphar. But his garment was left. I said at the outset that because he was handsome, that he was in trouble. The garment then there was made as an exhibit that he did something wrong. He attempt, He was accused to attempt to rape the wife of Putiphar. And you know, it's not only in the Israelites' rule, which is based in Deuteronomy, chapter 22, 23 to 27. If an individual have a sexual relationship with a woman who is married and with the consent of the woman, both of them will be stoned to, to death. But if the woman was forced to have a sexual relationship with a man, that woman will be spared and the man will be stoned to, to death. But in Egypt, I know that they were so very particular about this act of fornication. I read from a certain researcher that to the pharaohs, if they, were, they, they will engage in this immoral act, the punishment will be cutting of the genital organ and burning the individual. So it's not easy. It is not, it is a crime, you know, that should be abhorred by anyone else during, during the time. So here comes Joseph, accused. So what do you think would be the punishment for him? You know the story. He was not, his genital organ was not cut, and he was not burned, but instead he was put into prison in the house of the captain of the guards of Pharaoh. And that is, that was Putiphar. He was placed there. And according to some, you know, study that I have read, even in our Bible, in the commentary, that Andrew's commentary Bible, it says that Putiphar did not believe that Joseph attempted to rape his wife. That's why instead of killing him, he was just plunged into the dungeon, as Joseph had said, into prison. And that's another low experience in the life of Joseph. Very low experience being there. And next, he was there in prison, and it was then there again that the words, God was with Joseph. And the one who is in charge of the, the jail have seen that. So just like what Potiphar did to, to him, the jailer entrusted all the responsibilities to Joseph and that everything that he did prospered in that, in that place. And you know the story, the two highest you know, persons in in Egypt, in the person of the cupbearer of Pharaoh, and the baker of Pharaoh committed a mistake. Committed a mistake. So that seems to be like, uh, what can they do to the condition of Joseph? Can God use these two individuals in order to lift again Joseph to have this high experience? The story tells us that they dreamed. And it was Joseph that interpreted the dream. The cupbearer, he said, was lifted up to serve again Pharaoh. The baker, he said, was lifted up in order to be, to be hung. And after telling them the interpretation of the dream, Joseph said to the cupbearer, when everything went well with you, remember me. Please remember me. I did not do wrong. I did not do anything wrong. I was kidnapped and I was brought here. I was innocent. I did not attempt to rape the wife of Putiphar. So please remember me and bring me out from this place. 
Do you know how many years did Joseph waited so that he will be remembered by the cupbearer? Do you have an idea as to how many, how many years? For two years. So the next slide will tell us what happened when the two years transpired. The king had a dream. Pharaoh had a dream, which nobody can interpret. When the two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream, and he was standing by the Nile River. So you know the dream, the fat cows, and the thin cows, seven fat cows, and the thin, uh, and the thin seven cows, and the thin, you know, seven cows ate the fat seven cows. Nobody can interpret. A very healthy corn for seven, seven healthy corns, and you know, the unhealthy, the seven unhealthy corns eat or ate the seven healthy, healthy corns. It was only Joseph that interpreted the dream. He was only the one. And because of this, according to Genesis chapter 41, according to Genesis chapter 40, verse 8, I should say, here comes the experience in Genesis 40, verse, verse 8. We both had dreams but there is no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, don't interpretation belongs to God? Tell me your dream. Okay. So the issue about the dream came when nobody can interpret the dream of Pharaoh. And in Genesis chapter 41 verse 12, came in the cup bearer. He went to Pharaoh and there, she so said, was with us a young man, a Hebrew, servant of the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams. To each man, according to his dream, he interpreted. So if Joseph was 17 years old, and uh, Two years had passed that Pharaoh had dream and he was invited to interpret the dream of Pharaoh. The question is, how old was Joseph? From the time he left from Canaan to the time that uh, he interpreted he interpreted the dream of the two individuals in prison. So probably information cannot give us a proper guide in order to determine the, the age of Joseph. But let's turn to Genesis chapter 41, verse 46. Genesis 41, verse 46. It says, and Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. The word here, stood before Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, means that he was assigned to be second to Pharaoh of Egypt. He stood. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and do the business. First, designing plans that in seven years of abundance, storage will be built in order to store all the foods in preparation for the seven years of famine. So he was 30 years old. So in other words, he was 28 years old when he first interpreted the dream of the two persons, the cupbearer and 
the baker, 28 years old. He waited these two years long before his desire to come out of prison was realized. And not only to come out of prison, the Lord has placed him again to a higher position from the one in charge of the house of Potiphar to the one in charge of the affairs of the prisoners and now to the office of being second highest person in the whole land of Egypt at a young age of 30. And you know what again? The terms, the terms in Genesis 41, 38, repeated the terms referring to Joseph's experience when he was with Potiphar, Joseph's experience when he was in prison, and this is, this is the words. God was with Joseph. But in Genesis 41, verse 38, it says, the Spirit of God is with Joseph. The Spirit of God is with Joseph. What is in Joseph? That the Spirit of God was with him. We can go back to his, you know, conversation with the wife of Potiphar when he was, when he was told, lie with me. And that could be found in Genesis chapter 39, verse 9, where Joseph said, no one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? So what is this telling us? What is kind of attitude of Joseph towards Towards his God. Yes, every one of us is promised help from God. When we sin, we call for him, he's going to help us. Much more when we do right and call upon him, he will be with us. And that is what Psalm chapter 91, verses 14. Verse 14 to, to 15 is telling us, Mark, oh, uh, Psalms chapter 58, Jeff, could you please project that for the sake of our, our members? It is Psalm 58, verse, verses oh, 91, it's not 58, but 91. Psalms 91, it's a very familiar chapter. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. But verse 14 to 16 tells us, because he has set his love upon me, and this was Joseph, therefore I will deliver him he was delivered from a sure death from the hands of his brothers, and he was delivered in a sure death when he was accused as a rapist, attempting to rape the wife of Putiphar, and he was delivered in a prison house because the Lord was with Joseph. I will deliver him because he set his love upon me. Isn't it that Jesus Christ said, if you love me, keep my commandments? His love was expressed in keeping the commandments of, of God. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. If people that were doing wrong in the sight of God, and when they repent, God 
answers the prayer. How much more the man whose heart is with God in the person of Joseph. Sure enough, the Lord is going to answer his prayer. I will be with him in trouble. Indeed, God was with him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life and show him my salvation. Joseph died at the age of 110. You know, for us today, that years, that age, is so long a year that man can experience. Because Joseph was with, with his God. And going back to the text in Isaiah chapter 40, or is that 41 verse 13? I will help you. Yes, we are not like Joseph, probably. We have so many, you know, downfall experiences. But we have to remember that God made a promise. If we repent, confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. There's, some, there's something that we can learn from the experience of Joseph. When he was hated by his brother, he was hated by his brother. He did not retaliate. He did not, you know, plant revenge in his heart, saying that one day I'm going to meet you again and watch out. I'm going to do something bad against you. But instead, what, what did Joseph say to his brother when he revealed himself? Everything of his experience, so just remember, you know, from his birth to the time that he stood before Pharaoh at the age of 30, God knows already every event in the life of Joseph. God has already a plan in the life of Joseph before he was born, I should say. And thus, Joseph had acknowledged this. Therefore, he said to his brother, don't be afraid. It was God who put me here in order to save you from famine. When he said that to his brother, so the famine was, you know, from the time it started, it was like two years. And he said, there's still five more years of famine. So go and get my father. Come, come here with me. God knows. Don't be afraid. He was the one responsible why I am here in order to save you. This is a striking statement from the Bible. I don't even think in my whole life while I was in the Philippines that the Lord is going to place me in this place. And so as many of us, there might be another place that we can go, but how come that God has placed us here? Yes, this is not a perfect place. People here are not perfect. We are not perfect. You notice that. There are classes of opinions there are things that we hear that should not be spoken of. This is the place. We're not in heaven. But thank God. He placed us here for a purpose. And we should not be worried. Yes, we are fighting against ourselves. Our enemies, brothers and sisters, are not anybody around us. Our enemy is ourselves, we, our carnal nature that is betraying us. And you know, it is, it, it is a hard thing to change our character as what I have told you during my last preaching here last Saturday. It is not, 
It is not easy. It is hard. And that quotation from the spirit of prophecy, I told you that. It is not hard. Oh, it is, it is hard, I mean. It, it is hard. It is not easy. But God made a promise. And as a matter of fact, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, we are told that it is God that is working within us both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. But verse 12, look at that. We have a work to do. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. God has given us the love in our hearts not to be easily provoked. God has given that kind of love according to the reading this morning, that kind of love that is uh, not thinking bad against our neighbor. But in trying to implement that, there's a struggle. It is hard on our part, especially when you are being provoked. I said to my wife, my, my, stomach, is, my, my stomach is getting acidic because, my, because of myself, okay? Because of myself, I wanted to do what is right, but myself is telling me to do otherwise. It's a struggle, brothers and sisters. Yet we have a responsibility for everybody. Yes, we are struggling, but the Lord gave us also an instruction that when our sister fall into sin, we have, to, we have to rebuke our sister, our brother. We have to rebuke. That's our responsibility. And the kind of rebukes sounds to be like a harsh thing because in Titus chapter 1, verse 13, it says, sharply rebuked. But it's good enough that we are being told in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, the statement that restores such one in the spirit of, of meekness. So we can rebuke. But if rebuking is not enough, then comes in Matthew chapter 18. The discipline measure. You know the word discipline? The word chastise? Okay. They are not always connected with punishment. Yes, punishment will be a good means in the hands of God in order to open our eyes to what we're doing. But chastisement is not all about punishment. Chastisement means to make disciples, to teach people. When you look at the strong concordance, it is connected to discipleship. Okay? But of course, punishment sometimes is there in order to open our, open our eyes. We are told, uh, you know, in, we are told in, in Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter, in Hebrews chapter twelve, verse six, okay? the Lord the, the Lord disciplines the one He loves, disciplines, train, teach, guide, and chasten. The same thing. It is a repeated word. Discipling, teaching, okay? guiding. The Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Thank God we're still here. We did not decide to run away from God. We're still worshiping him because the chastening, the discipling are still going on in the midst of us, brothers and sisters. Joseph did not go against the dictate of his heart according to the fruit of love that God has planted in his heart. He loved his brothers and he, for, he forgives them. And uh, when the invitation to commit adultery, the response of Joseph was he ran away. Sometimes uh, we need to do this to run away from temptation. We cannot just stay long and expose ourselves to temptation. We have to get out of the vicinity of temptation. 
he ran away and remained respecting the law of God. When he was accused, that is slandering his character, a false malicious statement that damaged the reputation of another, he stayed close with God. God was with him. This was said when he was in prison. When his expectation was not fulfilled, he expected that he will be helped by the cup bearer. But it, it took two years. So just imagine, from the time he interpreted, every day, probably he was expecting that he will be taken out from prison, but it didn't happen. So it's just like the frustration of Naaman. You know, he was dipped into the water once, twice, nothing happens. So what is this? What is this? Okay. But the Lord has his own timing. The Lord has his own timing, brothers and, and sisters. So Joseph was not discouraged then. He was not discouraged. While we realize our helpless condition without Christ, we are not to yield to discouragement. We are not to yield to discouragement. Yes, there are things that we need to do. When we are being triggered to provocation, we have to do something. According to the statement of the spirit of prophecy, when we are, the last uh, three slides, could you please turn that in, Jeff? When we are under provocation or when we are being provoked, The, the next slide, please. You can go back to there. Go down. There. So there's a portion there. When provocation comes, let us be silent. Okay. When there are times when silence is eloquence, but in terms of provocation, it is said we must remain silent. We are to reveal what? Patience, the spirit of the spirit, Brother Jerry, right? Patience. What else? We have to reveal kindness, still fruit of the Holy Spirit. And forbearance, still fruit of the Holy Spirit, when we are being provoked to get angry. Go back, Jeff, please. Go back to the next, uh, to the one that I was reading, okay? There are times, okay, that's it, okay? And we are to trust Him and believe on Him and rely upon Him. We are to follow in Christ's step. If any man will come after me, he says, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. It may be a heavy cross to keep silent. He invites us to take his cross. And now Mrs. White shift to being keep, keeping silent. And she said, it might be a heavy cross. It's hard, to, it's hard to bear. Because when we are being provoked, we are being triggered, our natural tendency is to speak out and defend ourselves, to retaliate. And especially when we are being slandered, our tendency is also to slander. But that's why it says it's a heavy cross. But he said, she said, she said here, it may be a heavy cross to keep silent when you ought to. It may be a painful discipline, a painful kind of teaching, painful kind of learning. But let me assure you that silence does much more to overcome evil than a storm of angry words. So that's the kind of response that God is expecting us, brothers and sisters. And it tells us that Joseph had this kind of experience. He was provoked. And uh, the last part 
of slides that tells us about the life of Joseph. He revealed uh, how he perceived God in all his experiences while he was in Joseph. Do you know what's the meaning of the word Manasseh? The, Manasseh is the, is the eldest son of, of Joseph, right? Manasseh, you know the meaning of that? The word Manasseh, I think it's there, but it's found in Genesis chapter 41, verse 50, 51. He called his firstborn Manasseh. Why? For God said, for God said he has made me forget all my toil and all my, and all my father's house. He moved forward, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth to this new responsibility given to him, blessing the house of Pharaoh. So that's the meaning of the word Manasseh. And the second son, what's the name? What's the name? Ephraim. What's the meaning of the word Ephraim? Huh? And he name of the name of the second son called he Ephraim. For God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. In the land of my affliction, God made me fruitful. Could it be that in the time of our stay in this place, that we seem to feel that we are being afflicted, that it seems to us that we are being attacked, being maligned, being slandered, that God had permitted us to experience all this because he has in mind a purpose, that after all, we can say, thank God for the afflictions that you have permitted to happen in my life, for the chastening, for the learning that you have let me experience while I stay in Apple Valley Seventh-day Adventist Church, I will not be discouraged. God, if you permit all these aff afflictions, even according to Patriots and Prophets 129, paragraph 2, even the very trials that test our faith most severely and make it seem that God has forsaken us are to lead us closer to Christ. Lead us closer to Christ. Then when we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 11, I jump from the statement of the spirit of prophecy because I am going to insert the statement in between the statement of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 11. Verse 11 says, For we who live are constantly being delivered to death, for Jesus' sakes. So that sounds, they were afflicted, right? They were afflicted. They were in distress, thrown down, but not broken. According to, to St. Paul, affliction. And then after that, what happened? So that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So I'm going to insert this quotation from Patrick's and Prophets 129. Paragraph 2, for we who live are constantly being delivered to death for Jesus' sake in order to lead us closer to Christ that we may lay all our burdens at his feet and then what? That the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our flesh and we can experience peace here and which he will give us in exchange of the affliction that we have experienced. May the Spirit of God make alive his words in the heart of each one. That's my prayer.